it's a, it's a real honor to be here, I have to say. I was really surprised when I got the letter and uh, super pleased. It's my first time in India, and I'm uh, really excited to be here. I've always wanted to visit. Um, so I need to thank uh, IIT Guwahati, Technish 2017, and uh, the entire organizing team who got me here. Uh, they really went the extra mile to make sure I got here and, um, and made it here safely <laughs> and comfortably. Um, so actually, I can't, can, can you bring up the house lights just a little bit real quick? House lights? Anybody? <laughs> there we go. OK, I'm going to do a selfie real quick with you guys. <laughs> and then I'm going to ask for your help in something. <laughs> all right, so now, all right, everybody raise your hand like you're going to ask a question, OK? <laughs> hey, hold on. OK, and now, hold on, I'm going to count to three. Raise your hand again. Everybody raise your hand. I'm going to count to three, and when I say three, you say, when is Half-Life 3? OK? All right. Ready? Raise your hand. One, two, three. When is Half-Life 3? Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right, you can turn down the house lights. And uh, you can even turn down my lights a little bit, maybe make it so it's a little more bright up there. Um, uh, so I know that most of you are students. Probably 99% of you here are students. And so um, I kind of put this talk together, especially for you. Uh, it's called The Process is the Product, uh, which is, um, is my theme of the talk. Uh, and the, the way I think of it is this. I, I, one of my great favorite teachers of all time, which was a, my uh, high school film and television teacher, used to tell me this. I don't know where she got the quote. It's probably a Stan Brackage or some avant-garde video um, art artist who came up with this. But the idea is that the process you go through that makes the product, the art, you know, I mean, I'm an artist, that's what I do mostly, um, is not it, it, the product is not a result of the process, it is the process. And I, the best example I can think of is um, a cook, right? Someone who's going to make you dinner. When they start out, they have an idea in their mind of what your experience is going to be like when you eat, right? So already the product isn't what you normally think of. When you're thinking of a, like a cook is going to make dinner, it's going to be an object that sits on a plate, and you look at it, maybe it's pretty, it smells good, but really, the end goal is the eating of the food, right? So already you've got it, it the, the process starts all the way back in the cook's mind and ends when you consume the food. And everything in between is one thing. It's not two separate things, it's not the process and the product. The process is the product. The entire, from, from this end to that end, is the product. And as you know, like some people cook with a recipe, right? So there's a structure, some people make it up as they go. So already there's, there's choice there that can happen that can completely influence what's going to come out the, the back end uh, based on the front end. And then let's say you are using a recipe. Um, people have choices like, you know, exactly what is a tablespoon of salt? You know, some people a little more, some people a little less. Maybe they do it with their fingers because they have their own sense of what that means to put some salt in there. So even though you have a structure, a recipe, that person is going to make a different dish than somebody else. And then you have the intangible process, the hidden secret process, which is, uh, I don't know if you've seen, there's a movie called Like Water for Chocolate. And it's all about the love that is felt while you cook, right? And of course, you could probably break that down so that it's like if somebody's loving the people they're cooking for, they're going to pay more attention to the food and, and the way it tastes and make it extra good. Um, but maybe it's all these intangible, lots of little details and complex data that actually makes up that dish. And then, of course, the setting and the way it's served. And then, are you hungry? Um, that's a famous uh, French quote, like, hunger makes the best sauce. So if you're really hungry, oh, it's going to taste so good. 
Um, and if you're in love with the cook, all the better, right? Um, so that's, that's the idea, is that it's, it's one continuum. Um, let's see. So this is something I like to think about sometimes, and this is sort of a look at um, process. So over here on the left, you have the beginning, and you know the completion is your blue line, how much you've gotten done, and the yellow are the possibilities of what you can do. So at the beginning, you haven't gotten anything done, zero done, and everything's possible, right? There's nothing that's not possible at that point because you haven't done anything. You haven't eliminated any possibilities in the process. But as you go, I, I, in this case, it's a linear inverse, right? Like, as you go, more things get done, less things become possible, and by the end, you have the thing, which is kind of like something, but it's actually the thing, it's the end, and, uh, and nothing's possible. Well, everything's completed, but nothing else, nothing else is possible, right? Um, and I, that's, a, that's sort of the way I like to think about it. So over here you've got uh, the beginning, and over there you've got the end, and this is the entire, it's the process and the product. Now this is a really unlikely setup for how you're gonna create something, right? Um, this is way more likely because you're students and you don't know any better. And I would do the same thing too, which is, you know, I'm gonna procrastinate for as long as possible, like sleep late and, you know, not do anything, really. Um, and then I'm going to get really nervous right about there, but not nervous enough to do anything. And then I go, oh my god, if I don't start, it's already too late. If I don't start now, I really have no choice but to fail. And then you do everything right at the end, right? Um, there is a positive way to look at this, though, which is over here, maybe you're sleeping a lot and, and uh, participating in alpha dreams, right? Dreams where you wake up and you go back to sleep and you dream all kinds of weird shit and um, it makes like really cool thoughts. And, or you're consuming a lot of music, in my case, or really thinking about the product a lot. Um, and then you, you know, get it all done at the end. The, the sort of for big projects, the, um, the, the healthier thing and probably the better thing is to, is to do it like this, which is you get 90% of everything done up front. Um, because let's say you're doing you know, 120 pieces of music for a video game or 200 shots for a film. If you do this left part first, what you're doing is you're getting rid of risk. You're trying to get all your work done to a degree of quality that is maybe acceptable, maybe not. You make mental notes of what's acceptable, what isn't. Um, and, then you, uh, and then you spend the rest of the time iterating over everything, because you've identified all the risks. Like if you take all your time to the end and you like suddenly discover, oh, there's this thing over here that I have no idea how to do. I just wasted all my time and now I don't have time to finish. And you fail. And failing is never a good thing in the arts. I mean, when you're young it is. Like now is a great time to fail because you're young. Um, but this is a much more reasonable uh, way to do it, is to get. But anyway, this is, this is a way to look at process that I, I do like, and I think it's useful, and it's a useful thing to, to communicate. Um, the linear opposite for what's possible and what isn't is totally a fabrication. Sometimes they're completely nonlinear, not, not exact inverse of each other. Um, but it's a, it's a useful way to, to kind of look at it. Um, all right, so I know your students. And uh, you're mostly engineering students, from what I understand. And so there's no reason to assume that you know anything about animation or anything about music, which are two of the big things I'm going to talk about. I'll talk about programming a little bit, too, which you probably know more about. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for breadth. I'm going to cover as much stuff as I possibly can. So I'm going to talk a lot really fast. And, um, and I'm not going to go very deep. There's a couple things I will go deeper into. And I'll do my best to kind of explain it to you in a way that I make games. And one of the things that uh, we're really good at is, well, if it's done right, is training you slowly but surely so you don't get frustrated, you don't get lost right in the game. And so that's what I'm hoping to do here. Um, yeah, I'm just going to kind of 
try and help you understand and see. So uh, one of the things that uh, I've seen since I've been here and people, especially students, ask me about is because I, I'm very cross-disciplined. I work in a lot of different fields and hopefully through the process of explaining um, the breadth of my career, uh, you'll understand that there's actually some really clear threads there and it's not as surprising or unique or special as it might seem. Uh, which brings me to my story. I don't really like to talk about myself that much. I much prefer to talk about my art, which I do really like to talk about. Um, uh, but it was expressed that, you know, you're students and so you probably really want to know how I got where I am. So again, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out uh, uh, my story and complete with all the disciplines, not all, it's gonna be uh, a, in fact a small fraction, but the ones that I'm known for and that you would find interesting because otherwise we'll just be talking about me the whole time. Um, and, uh, and then I'm gonna iterate over that story across the different media types that I'm talking about and kind of cover two different things. Uh, one is the mechanics of production, so cooking, Right? You, you're going to have a process that's going to involve probably preparing your vegetables and then you're going to have some kind of heat thing where you warm things up and some spices, right? This is sort of the process component. And production, what I mean by production, um, that's sort of industry term for uh, getting from nothing to something when the heat is on, when it's time. Like you, you're actually in production. In film it means when they start shooting, right? Everything before that is pre-production. For this, the case of this conversation, I'm gonna call everything production, but the idea is when you're producing, producing stuff. Um, and then I'm gonna go back and go over it again, but this time talk about um, the complexity of performances versus authored content, right? Like, uh, I don't know, do I have a, we'll, we'll, we'll cover it more later, but uh, it's sort of in the cooking context, it's, like authored is something, is the, is the recipe. It's something somebody sits down and hand, meticulously kind of figures out. Uh, performances like music, are you playing the guitar or singing? Um, and the differences between those two um, and, and how they kind of, how, how things can get in the way. They can filter those, the, 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 the communication of that data from the, the uh, author to the, the uh, consumer and then what that means in the context of um, new mediums and the resolution through which it's being communicated. Like right now, um, if I were to sing, which I might do a little later, but I'm, I'm not that great at it, but either way, it's going through this crappy microphone and then it's gonna come out these speakers and so you're not actually getting the thing that I'm giving you, you're getting a filtered version of it, right? So that's sort of what that's about. Um, and new mediums always have a greater filter. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And then consumption, again, if you're sitting at the table, where are you eating? Are you like at a picnic somewhere? Um, consumption really is a big part of it and I'll cover that briefly at the end. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about going forward in regards to these, these topics, process and the, those two components of, three components of process. And we're gonna talk about machine learning a little bit because it's the big hype right now and it is super powerful. Um, but I think in the context of these things, there are some things to think about when you think about using machine learning for anything. Um, the convergence of games and linear media. Throughout this thing, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and forth between the term linear media and film, but linear media means something that isn't interactive. So video, YouTube, film, you know, Twitch for that matter, although Twitch is kinda oddly interactive, I guess. Um, but uh, so the convergence of those two things, which we're seeing, um, and then new mediums that uh, are likely to come up or uh, what people are talking about. And again, this is all in the context of process. Um, all right, now about me. Uh, you know, I've spent my whole life in the arts. Um, when I was a kid, I didn't want to be an astronaut. Uh, I didn't really want to be a fireman or any of those kinds of things. I just, like, I wanted to be a, a novelist, I think, was the first thing. A comic book artist, a magician. I, did, I was really into that for a while. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff, but they were all basically around the arts. Um, and so it's sort of how I've spent my life. Um, I've always been pretty obsessed with process. Um, you know, a lot of times people will call me a technical artist, and that's not untrue, but I'm also 
uh, on the one hand, I'm really obsessed with the process of production and the techniques and the technical components of that. I'm also really obsessed with that uh, actorly version too, which is the undefinable sort of hidden process that goes on. Um, and the truth is, is all art throughout all history has been, other than singing, singing is a, is a special one, um, has been connected to some form of technology, whether it was, you know, crushing pigments to make your paint, that's technology, right? Uh, guitar or violin, any, any step or progress in technology has always superseded or preceded um, new forms of art without, without fail. Um, so I started young, I'm not by any means a prodigy or anything, I just happened to be really interested in the arts, really young. Um, oh, and here's the other thing. You guys are all, I assume most of you, are I guess what we call um, digital natives, right? So you would have had the internet pretty much your whole life. Um, I am not by any stretch. I, you know, I'm 53 years old, so I pretty much grew up in the early, late 60s, 70s. Um, and while there were computers and I was exposed to them, it, they weren't, really weren't a part of my life um, to any really strong degree until probably the mid 80s. However, so our generation, I think Brooks is a similar age, um, we're sort of one generation under the Bill Gateses and you know the Bill Wozniaks and whatnot who invented computers. So we're almost kind of generation zero when it comes to computers and, um, and art. Like I've all, I have had access to computers when they met, made a big difference to how I did my art and how I was able to accomplish my art. Um, and so I think it, by going through this life story, you'll get to a little bit of a history, you know, not a deep one, but a little bit of a history lesson that you otherwise probably wouldn't be familiar with. Um, I think there's a really big difference between the fact that you have probably had a smartphone for a lot of years and what those applications mean versus those of us who, you know, would run an application with a command line and it would take five minutes to load up, <laughs> right? Um, that was a really different era and it had a really different meaning to the process of art um, early on. Uh, so the thing I'm gonna focus on is temporal arts, which is what I do for the most part. I do draw, but I'm not very good at it and it's not really what I focus on. By temporal arts, um, I mean the design of things that happen over time, right? Um, like even uh, story in film is a temporal art because you're basically communicating symbols or events over time that uh, add up to a, a story or a, an idea. Uh, music is clearly temporal art. I don't mean uh, Jackson Pollock, who is temporal while he's making his art. You know, he's throwing the paint down and splashing it around and kicking it or whatever. Um, because at the end of the day, he's making a static painting. And yes, the consumption of that painting does is a time you're <laughs> consuming it through time, but it wasn't designed, like the moments of time that you consume it, while through his symmetry or whatever, he might have guided you loosely, it's not a time-based form, right? So that's what I've focused on my whole life um, and what we're gonna talk about uh, pretty much today, um, if you kind of include programming in that. Um, art versus craft and science. This is something that, um, I've thought about quite a bit, I don't know, because I think too much. Um, but, the, whoops, not, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, the way I personally define art versus craft, um, and I know it's the classic, like, what is art, you know? But for me, the real, the gist of art is, it's an expression of a person. It's a, it's a person trying to be unique, it's trying to say, I am a unique being in the universe, here is, you know, here's my art. They don't have to think that, but that's sort of the gist of it. Whereas craft is the, it's the, it's the technique, the process they use to achieve the ends, the, 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 the artistic outcome, right? Um, they're not mutually exclusive. A lot of times, most times, art is gonna use some form of craft to achieve its end, but you can have craft that is devoid of art, right? Like it's entirely possible. Uh, commercial art is often that case, I think. Um, sometimes my work is somewhere in between 
because my craft is actually coming first. I'm trying to design a product that achieves an end. Um, but at the same time, uh, I'll often sneak my own art in there, or I'll find a way to, um, to make the craft of what I'm doing artistic. So it's me as a unique individual in the universe expressing something through a commercial form. Um, and now science is an interesting one because I think that can fit in that continuum as well. Uh, I don't know if you saw uh, Nadrian Siemens' talk yesterday. Um, that to me was total art. And that, it doesn't get any more science either. That was some heavy, heavy science. Um, but I think that there is a continuum all the way over there. I use science. And, I don't, and it has a process which is a little more dictated, I think, than, than art, for example. Um, but I think those two, those three, can all sort of co-mingle um, uh, amongst themselves. Uh, for the most part today, though, I'm going to talk about craft. Um, I'll talk a little bit about art in that second section. Uh, but that's sort of, all right, oh, so I already covered Generation Zero. Um, all right, and so. This is sort of an interesting one. Um, with the, the, cr the craft component and the production component, the thing that time, like the, the idea of, well, I'll get to that in a second. The, the, with time, as, as a student, you're going to need to like, study really specific things and become expert at something at some point in your life because that's a really important thing to do, to be expert at something, right? Um, if you're going to cross disciplines, however, you also like, kind of have to be able to step back and look at the bigger picture. And when you do that, um, particularly in production, art production, you know, you're optimizing for uh, quality. Learning to optimize for quality is super important. Because if you don't have quality, nobody's going to like your art right? at the end of the day. And, and it, it, it's not that hard of a thing to learn, but you have to go through a lot of failure to get there. Um, but then again, sometimes you've got to optimize for quantity. Because if you're doing, say, 200 shots for a film, and you don't get three of them done, all the other quality is not going to make up for the quantity that you're missing. Um, and then again, the secret, secret hidden process is something that I do really believe in, which is uh, it's that, that feeling that you, uh, you imbue in your art that is sort of undefinable. But I'll get to, to that in a little bit. OK, so this is a really famous overused quote, but it's still a great one. Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable but from magic. Um, and what I, the way I read that to mean is because we, our minds search for meaning in things, we, um, when we don't understand something, if there's a technology so advanced that we can't comprehend possibly how it's done, we uh, uh, assign something to it like magic or mysticism um, when really it is, we just don't understand the technology involved. And, I, and I, because it's Arthur C. Clarke, I assume what he's saying is that to get rid of magic, we need to understand um, Have I really been going for 43 minutes? That can't be right. Um, anyway, so we can't, uh, uh, we need to sort of get rid of magic by understanding things. Um, and then the other one is philosophy will clip an angel's wings, conquer all mysteries by rule and line, unweave a rainbow, which is John Keats talking about Newton, who basically, I guess, uh, unwove the rainbow. And rainbows are beautiful, and they're meant to be magical. And I think magic is a useful thing in the world, and that's where that hidden process comes in. Um, so you don't, you don't want to understand things too well. All right, so my father was a professor. He used to bring home technology all the time. A uh, lot of this stuff, this is a video camera that recorded reel to reel. Um, my brother and I would play with them, but we were not particularly adept at art. So, uh, and the, the preschool, or not preschool, sorry, the elementary school I went to had a television studio um, that we would go and play Star Trek in. Again, didn't really make much use of it. But the 8 millimeter film camera, I really did make use of and really got into doing stop motion uh, animation, which is you take shots of something and move it around and, and take another shot, take another shot, take another shot. And at the end, you have animation, which you see with the Leica films like Coraline and uh, Kubo, the, the two strings. Um, and I, I really got into that as well as hand-drawn animation. I wasn't particularly good at it, but I found it really interesting. I was not a prodigy. 
Uh, my parents got me a guitar when I was seven, and I immediately tuned it up too, too high and then broke the neck. Um, and, uh, and then sat there and went right, and just thought it was the funnest thing. And I still had that guitar um, later when I made records and used it on a record. But they, they got me drum set, piano, and uh, the thing I found is that I really didn't have, uh, at that age anyway, uh, enough discipline to really study. Um, and what I really wanted to do was write, but nobody was kind of figuring that out and helping me along with it. Um, all right, so let's see if this works. Um, you know, I'm old enough that my first, oops, video game was Pong when it originally came out. I should figure out video now. Um, right? And, uh, and man, I just thought it was the greatest thing ever. I just was like super into it. Um, of course, then Atari later came out with a console that had cartridges. And uh, I think with Donkey Kong or something, it was a big success. But then they put out a whole bunch of terrible games. Um, and, and this one has some issues with it, too. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, my dad was a professor, had access to computers like 1970, 1971. He would go take me in and dial it up in a modem thing and bring up pictures of the, the planets in their actual position at that actual day. And I'd just be like, oh my god, that's so cool. Um, and then I'd be like, can I make a move? And it, no, because you would say, he'd say, well, we can update it to right now, push a button, and 10 minutes later, the screen would come back up. Um, it was really early computing. I thought of them mostly as toys. We got a, a Commodore, uh, was it a VIC-20, I think, um, later. And I programmed a, a text-only maze game really bad idea, but um, you know, I got really into, into that. Again, I really thought of it, though, this is like in 1979, 1980 at the latest. Um, and so there was no, there was no there there, really. You know, that It was just kind of a toy that I was interested in. And then in high school, we had a statistics class that they, would, that they also had computers, and they tossed Fortran. And I was really interested there, too. Um, in fact, to the point where I was like, oh man, if I got out of school, I could make, you know, go make $10,000 a year, and that'd be cool. And then I was like, ah, oh, but then I'd have the green bill and be a, an accountant, and um, I, I didn't want to. Um, and so, which leads me to uh, bands. I picked up the guitar for real um, around about that same time, 13, 14, um, and just like fell in love. The instant gratification of playing music. And, uh, and entertaining people on stage really, really spoke to me. Um, so then right after high school, I mean, I played in bands all through high school. Um, before I was out of high school, I was playing professionally in a bar, you know, five nights a week, four hours a night, 15-minute breaks. Um, you know, your hands are bloody at the end of the night. But I really kind of learned my chops and, and how to function in that environment and to entertain people who... You know, if, I don't know if you've seen the Blues Brothers, but I played behind chicken wire, people throwing bottles at it, the, the whole nine yards. Uh, but I traveled to Japan. I lived in Tokyo for two years. And this was a really important time for me because I explored all of these things. Uh, it was a really interesting time. Um, Lori Anderson was really big. Uh, Japan was crazy. They had giant billboards with Joseph Boyce. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a conceptual artist from G Germany. Um, and they were really into kind of out there art um, way more than I'd seen in, in the US. And everybody was kind of going nuts for all kinds of stuff. It's the first place I got a computer that you could do art with. I programmed an animation program, and then did animation, and did avant-garde performance video art. Um, I did composing for uh, some commercial interests. Uh, did some work with Ruichi Sakamoto, which is pretty amazing in retrospect. Um, I was, you know, 19, uh, and did, you know, got, yeah, got into all those things. Some film directing, which was really interesting. Um, by way of, I, I did that, and then I finally decided it was time to come back to the States and got back into bands. And at that time, it was the mid-'80s, and punk rock and really loud, angry, aggressive music was really happening. But more importantly, the DIY, which means do-it-yourself scene, 
uh, was really blossoming, and I got really into that and made lots of records, you know, um, toured the world many times over, the United States uh, dozens of times, um, and really learned about the process of making something from nothing and selling it and making a living from that, and then dealing with the, your, cust you know, your customers, I hate saying that, but your audience and the people, the fans that are, are paying for you. Um, in that period, I was in stu the studio a lot and got hired by this company, Euphonics, uh, who make uh, big kind of high-end studio recording consoles and was their first uh, outside programmer. I learned to program uh, parallel distributed embedded systems, which is, you know, it's basically um, assembly language coding that you put on a chip and then you put the chip in the console, and I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, it was definitely an experience in really deep, large, uh, large code base programming and kind of deep programming, uh, and it paid the bills pretty well. Um, and then I got a job at this company called Protozoa, which I won't go into too much, but it was a real-time animation company uh, in San Francisco that came out of a company called Colossal Pictures. Colossal Pictures was, I don't know if you guys know MTV, MTV was a station that just played music videos once upon a time, and then eventually they started doing these short animated bits, a uh, thing called Liquid Television, and this company came out of that, and we did uh, real-time animation, um, and had a good run, five or six years. Um, I worked with a young guy named Bay Rate, who was you know four or five years younger than me, well, he's, I think it's somewhere in that ballpark, um, best digital modeler I've ever known, and uh, we'll talk about him. He made this, this character here. Um, but it's real-time animate performance animation. So I don't know if you know what motion capture is, but this is motion capture rig using uh, electromagnets. So there's a giant orb or a box that makes a, a magnetic field, and then you attach these uh, magnetic sensors to your feet, your hands, your elbows, your knees, your waist, your chest, and your head and uh, they, it outputs uh, 3D position and orientation coordinates um, that then can be read in and uh, drive a puppet in the computer. Uh, it was, a as you can see, it has a giant bundle of wires and we'd wear a heads-up display like VR, but you would use it to see what your puppet's doing. So it wasn't inside out because you can't see what that is. It was more like a camera uh, back at it. To run this, we were using the Silicon Graphics Onyx machine, which is the size of a small refrigerator um, and cost about a quarter million dollars, right? So it, this, is, this is early, it's like 1995, you know, more than 20 years ago, um, but that's what it took. Uh, this is an example of some performance animation. You can see this is a human, right? So there are the sensors, the hands, the elbows, the head, the neck, you know, the feet. And this puppet is set up such that that hand controls the head, that hand controls the, the hand, and these two feet control the stomach, right? And so that you can kind of do a worm like that. Um, it was a, a weird company, but pretty cool uh, work was getting done there. This is a good example of there are all the, the sensors coming off of the thing and then mapped to the different size puppets. Um, all right, here's a... Interesting example I'll set up here real quick. This is probably, I don't know, 500 polygons at the most. Um, you'll notice this is a very early web browser, uh, and I'll get into why that is in a minute, but um, I'll, and I excuse the video quality. It, it, this stuff comes from a long time ago, and it's tough to, whoops. Can I do this? Nope, I guess not, hold on. I'm not sure what that was, but let's see. Oh my gosh, look at that! Holy mother of God! <laughs> So we were doing some pretty funny, weird stuff. Um, but uh, I was there for five years and 
directed multiple projects, um, animated a ton of them, was the animation director on a whole bunch of them. Um, and by the end, it was kind of the dot-com boom. We created our own station, which was called Dot Comics, uh, which you couldn't, like downloading a, 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 a QuickTime video, like a few minutes would take like 20 minutes. So YouTube was out. That was not, that kind of thing wasn't happening. So what we'd do is you'd download the geometry and then you'd download the animation data and the sound, right? And so it made it possible to watch cartoons. Um, but I also, I met a, a, uh, this guy, Bay Rate, who went on uh, to New Zealand and called me and was like, dude, you gotta come down here. There's this project going on. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, this guy, Peter Jackson, is making Lord of the Rings. And I was like, no, I don't think so. I just, that sounds like a bad idea. I've seen his movies, they're, they're, they're not very good. <laughs> and then I talked to them and said, uh, okay, that sounds a good idea, actually. Um, I went down there and I was there you know, a full like year before actual, like they were doing filming production, but uh, post-production, the CG part was still in pre-production. So pre for post. Um, this is us at the, the um, set for Minas Tirith, which was, you know, an amazing, amazing set, incredible construction. There, I was there when there really weren't very many people at Weta Digital um, and participated in sort of the setup for a lot of it. Uh, here we can, Watch real quick. I was, on a, I was on a team called the Massive Team. We were doing AI-based animation, um, which uh, I'll show you. The, these, these people up front are film. The background is, is mostly probably uh, CG or, or miniature sets. And then all the, the humans in the far background are um, actually CG. Let me see if I can. All right, so you can see all this stuff back here. That's all um, our team. You can see all that stuff, all these guys. In fact, all of this is, is CG, and it's all massive, which is a software program written by Stephen Regulus, a really clever system. Um, all those guys, all that. Um, you can see there's guys working and, and whatnot. Uh, I showed up early. You know, my, my job uh, was all kinds of stuff. I worked with Peter Jackson looking at the storyboards, breaking down the shots. We did pre-production for all three films up front, um, identified all the motion capture, worked with the uh, stunt team and, the, and the, the sword master to figure out all, how all the different um, character types would behave and how they would fight with what weapons and then how to break them down into a, a, a motion tree and, and use that motion tree then to drive animation. Um, you can see here. Now, this is, there's also something else that happened in this process. Is, see, this is the fellowship right there. Um, because uh, I had done so much motion capture and directed so much motion capture, I was also, um, and here, here they are again, I was also tasked with uh, directing the, the fellowship, like Sir Ian McKellen and Billy Boyd and, and whatnot. Um, and so that was Sean Bean. That was really uh, particularly interesting. Um, and so I spent a lot of time with those guys. I was on a team, though. You know, uh, I was one of the senior guys. But um, there was a team of us, and we all worked really long, long days. There I am with Billy Boyd, who is Pippin. And, uh, and yeah, so, so there you got that. Uh, I can't tell where the timer is, but anyway. Um, so I came home. I, I was there for two years. I, I did the pre-production on all three films, which is why I'm credited with all three films, um, and then worked through the first film. And at the end of that, my wife got pregnant, and we decided to come back to the United, back to the United States to, to have our, our daughter there. Um, because I thought I would I was work too hard if I was in New Zealand, still working on a film a big film like that. Um, instead, I came back and worked too hard in the United States, whoops, on, uh, on the Matrix. Uh, so, right, Matrix sequels, I gotta clarify. It was Reloaded and Revolutions, and I was hired, 
ostensibly to go in and do something similar to what we had done on Lord of the Rings, use uh, AI sort of architecture to animate uh, the sentinels uh, in a big swarm for the siege team. I was on this team with a group of guys, and the siege is where all the sentinels come down and break into the big dome and, and slaughter everybody. Um, and when they explained to me the number of shots, how many sentinels they wanted to do, and how they wanted to shoot it, which is funny because both Peter Jackson and the Wachowskis would describe it like this. Well, we want like a natural battle to be just happening, and we want to be there like we're documenting it, you know? <laughs> Which is, of course, not true, because the second you do something like that, they're like, they get their camera, they're like, can we get these guys over there? And they actually want to compose the shot. Um, uh, but when they described the amount of work they wanted done, I said, uh, so that's impossible. We can't, it's no way we can do that. And they said, okay, start tomorrow. <laughs> um, here's a quick sequence from that, and you'll see... Um, You'll see, whoops. You'll see a bunch of this. All of those sentinels um, have their own brains, we call them, their own little programs that run. And I'll get into that a little bit more, a little further on. Um, but uh, it was uh, quite a project and really uh, fascinating and, and a lot of work. Um, and then after that, I, I left ESC and kind of went to work for various studios, freelance, doing everything from CG supervising, um, to just bit piece work, like usually they'd find some difficult problem that nobody else could solve and hand it to me, and, uh, and I'd do some compositing um, and other bigger uh, endeavors. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, Matthew Barney's Drawing Restraint 9, which is a total art film, but really had some interesting, interesting visual effects in it. Um, and, and uh, so I was doing that, and I was kind of adrift. I was free, what we call film gypsy. I was going from film job to film job, and, and uh, not unhappy, but also seeing that a lot of work was going overseas, um, and kind of seeing that, that being hands-on was going to not actually work after a while, and I was going to have to become in charge, which I wasn't, you know, I wasn't that excited about. Um, and then, uh, 
this happened. Um, I went to see one of those films. I can't remember, honestly, which one it was. I think it was probably um, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. And beforehand, I saw this trailer. Oops. No, oh, this keeps... This is just some pheromone thing that's kicking in. Pheromones are scents that are given off by the female that create that original attraction. Of course it's all chemical to start with. The true love is incredible. But is it rooted in physiology rather than our hearts? I'm kind of attracted to her. It doesn't make any sense. Why does it have to make sense? You slept together? It was before we were dating. You're dating? Sort of. Sort of's a good description. I just thought we had something that night. I didn't think you'd end up... You're the one who doesn't believe in that feeling thing. Why me, Rand? What makes me special? So I was at the theater, and this, this trailer comes up, and I was like, God, that sounds really familiar. And then I realized that a friend of mine who had scored this film had gotten me to come in and play a bunch of guitar like months and months earlier. And all that music in there, the guitar, is me. And I, I, was, I was like, I was so just like, oh my god, that's the coolest thing ever. And, uh, and that's when I thought, hey, maybe that's what I should be doing next. Um, and so I let my friend Bay, who I told you about, oh, Bay, by the way, is the one who got me down to New Zealand. Um, he designed uh, and modeled the whole system that ran Gollum's face, right? So uh, he animated a bunch of Gollum and put that whole system together. One of the brightest guys I know, um, still today, for sure. And uh, so I, I called him. I was like, dude, I want to do music. I want to do music for film. And he said, dude, I'm in Seattle. There's this company up here. And they make video games that are amazing. And they've got this, this new platform, how they're going to distribute games. I was like, again, I was like, oh, I don't want to move to Seattle. Like, I don't, I don't know. And he said, well, you got to come up and meet these guys at Valve. And so now, at that time, Valve was known primarily for Half-Life, uh, Counter-Strike, Team Fortress. Classic, um, Day of Defeat, of course, Half-Life 2, which is still kind of one of the best games of all time, um, and Steam, which was a, a, new, a new platform, um, which I was super interested in. I was like, wait a minute, you mean you can shove like data to people and you know update your content? And so I went up and visited and um, and saw the team that Bay was working on. They were uh, building this thing called the Source Filmmaker, which is basically, I'll get into it a little more later, but it's basically using a game as an editing and performance system to make film and video, linear content. Um, is this the one that we'll play now? Um, and basically, what it does is you can see here, there's, we, and we made a ton of videos with it. You, um, you know, in a traditional editing suite, uh, you would actually have film and cut the film, whereas this is a live game, and when you do a cut, it's, you're just changing the camera angle, right? And, and animation will automatically update itself and whatnot. But anyway, I went up and visited these guys. They were doing really cool stuff, um, and at first they wanted me to be an animator or director, and I was like, no, 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 I'm, I've changed over to music. And uh, a year kind of went by of back and forth and working on various uh, projects that haven't actually come out. And uh, eventually they said, OK. And then I said, I don't know. And um, eventually then I, I, I went up and uh, started working with them um, full time. And, uh, and from then, I, I pretty much worked on every game after. Um, sometimes composing all the music, sometimes composing some of the music, sometimes just making myself useful, um, sometimes, you know, just testing the game. Um, but there's just been a, a bunch of them ever since. 
Um, and then now as we expand into other things, I really do just try to like, you know, Steam VR, I just try to make myself useful if I can, but we have whole teams that are kind of taking care of, um, of that stuff. And as we get into hardware, which is interesting and I do have a background in, uh, I'm always, you know, kind of looking at what, what can I do to help and, and, uh, and what's the next thing there. Um, okay, does anybody have idea? My, my computer doesn't seem to be telling me the proper time. How, how long has it been? Anybody know? No? <laughs> all right, well, I'm just going to go. You're going to have to stop me. When, all right, so mechanics of production. The idea here is, is it's like a, if I'm going to tell you how to cook Italian, I'm not going to give you like a tablespoon of this and a this or that. No, I'm not going to give you a recipe. I'm going to say Italians cut up a bunch of garlic. They heat up a bunch of olive oil. They put the garlic in. They might put some carrots. They might put some celery, right? I'm going to kind of walk through the process. There's always going to be a bunch of tomatoes probably, um, pasta inevitably. I'm going to give you the general layout of how Italians cook. I'm not going to give you a recipe. If you want to cook, then I'll give you the recipe, and then you can learn all the individual elements of how that works. So going through uh, production, I explained, um, every, everything we make in life, uh, including science, has a process. Um, and that process can be broken down into a way that people who don't know that process can understand, and then can, through that breakdown, can look at the individual elements and understand like, oh, I need some expertise here to be able to do this thing, or I need somebody to fill that expertise. Um, and I think you, know, you can apply that probably to science as well. Um, some processes can be automated, which is an interesting thing, and some inputs to the processes can be improved. And I'll get into that a little more here in a second, but automation is often what we view as an advance in the technology itself or the art form, right? Um, and I will explain that further. A process usually has some kind of input, like let's say, um, you know, if, if you're shooting some animation, the input would probably be the drawings. Um, the camera is the, is the process of shooting it, and the output would be the film that has the frames that have resulted from that shooting, right? And then that output can then be input into some other process um, as a way to think about it. Um, like I said, they can be recorded. The camera records a frame. Um, in the case of, let's say, video, it might be just passing through into something else. It would be dynamic in that case. Um, and then processes can contain other processes. It's basically just a, a node-based system for talking about these sorts of problems. And then, of course, there's the final output and how it's consumed. Um, so, all right, now, uh, this one, which we, Pong is a computer game. Oh, wait, actually, I don't want to do that here. I'm going I'm to do it on the next one. It's just code, right? And code uh, is a pretty basic thing. Over here, you've got your documents are your code. Um, you run it through comp compilation, assembly, linking, and then you've got an executable is your output. It's a really, right? So there you go. This square is the process. Here's your, your document, which is your input, and this is your final output. Um, I'm not going to go into the code component, because otherwise we could talk about this single thing for the rest of however many minutes I have. Um, but you know, this can be automated. Um, and we are seeing that they're using deep nets now to write code which is an interesting thing. Um, but this is the more likely thing. Uh, this, once upon a time, you would run the compilation by hand. You would do the assembly by hand, and you would link it all together by hand. Um, whereas now, you know, you just hit a button and it all, it all happens. Um, all right, so we're going to talk really quickly about animation just because it sets us up for the, the rest of it. I'm not going to assume any of you know anything about animation. I'm sure some of you think this is super boring, but you're just going to have to bear with me because I'm doing it like soup to nuts for anybody who doesn't know. So let's say you're shooting a film. You're going to use a camera. You're going to end up with a bunch of frames. You're going to sequence those frames, uh, which is post-production. Post um, that means editing, uh, compositing. Compositing is taking multiple images and overlaying them to create one image that might have CG in the background, who knows. Um, you'll do color correction, color timing. Um, you're going to conform the audio to it, and then at the end, you've got a movie, OK? Um, if this is animation, you're going to do key animation, which is basically 
Uh, OK, so let's say I'm walking. You would do a key like this. You would probably do a key like that, do a key like this. Um, in betweening is drawing all the different steps in between, right? Um, and that's, this used to be done uh, all by hand by the artists themselves. Um, and then I think what they did is, uh, well, the way they automated the in-betweening and the coloring, so it's all done in pencil, probably then pen, and then they color. The way they automated these two things, uh, the rest of this, by the way, is still this, is the same as the other one, right? Uh, but these two things, which took a lot of time, the way they automated it was by shipping it um, most likely to the Philippines. I borrowed this very dystopian image from Banksy um, and automated it by having a bunch of people uh, do the in-betweening and the, the coloring. Um, which still is often the case today. Um, there's still, they still will get factories in the Philippines and elsewhere, probably some here in India, to do all the work. Um, but there is a, a lot of software now that will handle those components for you. Uh, music, the process is going to look like this. This is just linear music. You've got a guitar that gets recorded. So the, again, I'm not telling you about this part over here. There's no how you play the guitar, how you set up the microphones, any of that stuff. It's just you have a guitar track, you have a bass track, drums, vocals. Um, they're all run through a mixer, which is that uh, console, which it's a. So if you're running short of time, sir, if you can wrap it up quickly, then we'll take a couple of questions and end it. Oh, OK, OK. Um. <laughs> uh, anyway, so this is all. Yeah, it's all put together. Um, there's a console. There's, you can do this for all of these different systems. Um, computer graphics has the automation of the in-betweening that I talked about earlier uh, was geometry and materials run through rigging, which moves the, the puppet around. And uh, you have the in-between there. Um, uh, this is actually performance which is that. Um, Are you running for president? Larry, you heard it right here. Yeah, I, I am running, Larry, and I'm, I want to shake things up in Washington. I want to be the ferret in the pants of government. And I'm announcing it right here because this is, uh, let's face it, ground zero for American politics. You are you, where the rubber meets the road, big guy. So that's like real-time output live over satellite with CNN um, in the mid-'90s. Um, these systems, instead of doing it by, instead of, uh, instead of uh, automating these things, we automated the actual animation itself um, through using fuzzy logic and, and uh, AI systems that way, which are expert systems, um, basically hand designed tens of thousands of nodes um, of fuzzy logic uh, designed to sense the world around you. Um, and the way that kind of looks here is per agent, that's per person that's running around on the ground, it's going to sense the world. It's a virtual world, so it's not like robotics where you need cameras or, or those sorts of things. It's actually just looking around in the, 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 the actual definition of the space. Uh, process those, sentence, those senses. Choose the motion from a motion tree, whether it's walking or not. Um, procedurally adjust that animation and then do that for each and every character. And they're going to sense each other and avoid each other. Um, it's a really complex system, but, uh, but it, it achieves the goal at hand. Uh, same thing here for the swarm. The biggest difference is that the sensing of the world uh, sends its data directly over to the procedural adjustment because they're flying, and it's, it's mostly procedural animation there. Um, so AI behavior has emergent behavior, which is each agent has its own brain, um, which functions against each other. Um, and, and as a group, they, they create a behavior. Um, they can see. They can sense the ground. They can uh, find navigation meshes. They can sense each other and uh, motion. Uh, Massive is a pure fuzzy logic system, tens of thousands of nodes. Um, the swarm system is more of an expression-based system, but it uses the same ideas. Um, they're both expert systems. Uh, they, Massive uses motion capture and motion trees, whereas the swarm uses procedural animation. Uh, I don't need to talk about that much. Um, yeah, there's that. 
Um, OK, so doing music, uh, it's just like, like the, the previous thing, but you've got dialogue, sound effects, foley, music. Um, mix controls are automated. Here you see this, uh, the, the bit for um, the Team Fortress 2, Meet the Medic. Uh, hundreds, that's not even, that's probably a quarter of all the channel. I uh, had probably 150 channels going. Um, we'll watch this real quick. I'm running out of time. Apparently, I talk too much. Um, and, uh, and then we can ask some questions, because I'm sure you guys have a, have a lot of questions. Move! I can't move! Come on, come on, almost! Oh When the patient woke up, his skeleton was missing, and the doctor was never heard from again! <laughs> anyway, that's how I lost my medical license. Archimedes! No! It's filthy in there. Birds. <laughs> now, most hearts couldn't withstand this voltage. But I'm fairly certain you're hot. What was noise? The sound of progress, my friend. Ah, perfect. Kill me later. Where was I? There we go. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Oh, that looks good. Nice there. Should I be awake for this? <laughs> then no. But as long as you are, could you hold your hip cage open a bit? I can't seem. Ah! Oh, don't be such a baby. Lips grow back. No, they don't. What happens now? Now? <laughs> Let's go practice medicine. Actually, real quick, I'm going to cover just this section because I know some people are going to be slightly interested in this. So making music, you've got the four tenets. And you, so you've got themes, motif, ambience, action. These are sort of more meta ideas that go into making music. Um, linear music, I won't go into that too much. Nonlinear, so a game engine, I'm, this is sort of the system I described earlier. But if you've got a player controlling your camera and the simulation code, all of a sudden you've got a game engine. You add audio to that. And that's what that looks like. So 
running audio in a game engine, you've got code that triggers like footsteps and sound effects and gunfire and controls the mix and summing, the, the console board I was talking about, and then the music fits all into that and it goes out. So it's the same as recording music and anything else, it's just being run by code at, at runtime. Um, if we look at the music component, here you've got your themes, motifs, ambience, and action, but it's now being run by game code. And there's a bunch of different ways that can happen, and uh, that is, uh, would take even longer than uh, how much time I've overtaken now to uh, fully talk about. But um, here, if you listen in Left 4 Dead, the way Left 4 Dead... <laughs> There's a dozens of those little snippets that happen in the game, and they represent the, the, the gameplay and the game state, um, and, and they're played at ran, not random, but with a kind of AI control mechanism. So the whole thing kind of makes a music, but also tells you what's happening in the game. Um, there's no agents in a system like that. There is emergent behavior. Uh, I, somebody could probably write something that has each piece of music is its own agent, but that'd be a little weird. I, I mean, I'm sure it's a cool way to do it. Um, uh, hello? There it is. Um, it is emergent. Uh, it senses the world or the game state, just like the agents in, uh, in, in um, Lord of the Rings and in the, the swarm stuff in the Matrix. Um, processes the world, chooses which cues to play, and plays, procedurally adjusts and plays the music. Um, it's an expert system as well as opposed to uh, something like a uh, uh, machine learning. Um, fuzzy logic is really useful for this kind of thing because it's not brittle logic. It's not, it, not if this, then that. The data that's coming through is adjusted, and so it'll adjust volumes and actually gently move between states, um, in, which is super useful for animation and music. Um, Here's one other example from Portal 2, which is um, easier to, Left 4 Dead, you really literally have to play the game to hear the music, um, whereas in, oops, Portal 2, um, it's more, it's more clear. In that example, Portal 2 was an interesting problem. I can kind of skip over that. Um, I'm going to wrap this up real quick. Linear versus nonlinear output. Uh, in film, you're making frames, so everybody kind of contributes to this factory line, and the end goal is the frame. Whereas in games, you're making a program, so you're using something like Perforce, and everybody's contributing to this monolithic model. Um, and it really is a very different process. Um, I'm not going to run through this quick review because I think we're out of time. And I have a whole other section that I'm just going to skip. Um, but I think you can see by, by kind of laying it out like that, you get an idea that you know, automating music is actually just like making music in the studio. It's just you're applying a, a computer program or process to do that. Same goes for the animation of uh, the, the characters in Lord of the Rings. Um, and so there is really a throughput there, um, on, or a thread, I should say on how that stuff is done and how you think about it. And usually I, I say like, oh yeah, we made these agents and people love to talk in that abstract way where it's like they have brains and they run around and they avoid each other and then they fight. And that's a super cool thing to talk about, but it doesn't really help you understand what's at play there. Really all we're doing is automating the choosing of pieces of, of motion capture, throwing them together, procedurally adjusting the character to move around on the train. Um, same goes for music. Of course, like I said, uh, the hidden process of being making it creative and having the 
the beauty component come through, the complex data that's interesting and makes people feel something is like a whole nother kind of the expert side of this. But by laying it out and thinking about anything this way, like what is the process? What's the, what's the recipe? What's the, not, not even the recipe, but what's the structure of the recipe? Um, you can communicate anything. And so people in your mechanics, you know, mechanical engineering can talk to people over in your programming. And people in your art can talk to people um, in, I don't know, what, what else have you got here? Chemistry, right? Um, and if you can kind of think about things that way, then all of a sudden everybody can talk to each other and more or less um, understand what each other is doing. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and call it because I, I guess we're running out of time. I think we started late as well. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or you can also um, grab me outside later. Thank you. Hello, uh, anyone who wants to ask a question can come down here. So uh, from your talk, uh, what I can see is uh, the whole, your whole, whole work is 95% uh, science, 95% uh, art, and then 10% uh, bring them together. Now, uh, how do you do all this, like as in the amount of in our engineering, we do uh, machine learning, we use fuzzy logic, but then we just stop there. We don't go beyond to animation and music and stuff like that. So taking that, putting it into music, that seems like uh, a really challenging task. And then af after that, being up to date in technology, because technology moves for uh, forward every day, uh, being up to date in technology, that's uh, another difficult task. Uh, how do you make all that happen? Hello, oh there it is. We're having some problems with the audio apparently. Um, I agree, yes, and the, the latter part of the talk, which I probably just, I just went too slow, um, I kind of addressed that a little bit. And what it is is that um, when, when you're using, say, fuzzy logic to, uh, to drive music, right, you're losing a component, like if I just wrote a piece of music and played it for you, it would be a piece of music and it would be as beautiful as I wrote and that's it, right? Um, if I'm breaking it apart into pieces as I'm using fuzzy logic to put it back together, I'm losing a component of the beauty of that music because it's being filtered. I'm like running it through this new system. However, this new system also gives me the power to do something new and interesting. And if I understand what I did making the music in the first place, the choices in my brain that I go like, oh, I'm going to take this theme and I'm going to put with that motif. and I take that expertise, it's why it's called the expert system, you put that expertise into the, the AI that you're designing with the expert system, and usually what I've seen is that you build as many components of that as you can to make something interesting and to achieve the goals you're after, but then there's gonna be some errant cases, right? Some cases that don't work, that are errors, and then what you do is you build in other things to catch those errors and eject them, right? Um, and it, it, it's the nice thing about art, right? And I sure, I'm sure your robotics team probably sees the same thing, right? You design for all the cases you want, but then you've got some bad case you don't like, and you design something to catch it and throw it out, right? Um, that's one way to think about it. Expert systems are great that way, but it really is you lose something by moving to the AI, but you also gain something that's kind of a new art. And in the case of, say, Lord of the Rings, you gain you know, 10,000 agents running around, you know, that you, it would be really hard to do by hand, right? Um, the other thing to think about with machine learning that I think is really interesting is machine learning is really good at picking up on the really fine, complex data, right, that goes with, say, an expressive form. Um, however, it's, it's really hard to parameterize, so an artist can do that latter part where you add something in. And it's an interesting thing I think in the future we'll see with uh, art mixing with machine learning is how to add the artist part back in um, because the parameters going into a machine, you know, a, a deep net is really hard. You know, you train it and then you sort of have your system. I'm sure some of you guys ex understand way better than I do, but uh, hope, hopefully that answered your question. Thank you.
Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. I'm a big movie buff. So I want to ask you about mo motion capture. Of course, you know Mr. Andy Serkis. He's a great motion capture artist. So he's played like he's everywhere in the motion cap motion capture. He's in the of course played the Gollum and uh, he's in the Star Wars. He's in the P P Rise of the Planets of the Apes. So apart from the really wide range of the characters that he's played, what's your favorite one? Oh uh, well, you know Gollum's my favorite, of course, in Lord of the Rings. Like Gollum's amazing. Um, I'm biased because I have friends who are very much involved in that, but it's also the first. It's the first really believable CG character, I think, um, in a live action film. So, yeah. But he's amazing. And the Planet of the Apes stuff is great. Like the, the motion capture, again, it's that the ability to communicate that fine detail and the expressiveness of the performance through the filter of all the, the processing. Um, is really impressive um, where they've gotten with that. Um, and you'll see, if you look at uh, the Unreal Engine work with Ninja Theory, I think it is, they just did a thing where there's facial capture and it's all real time. Um, and that's incredible, like where they can actually perform it and watch it and it looks completely real and believable. Um, you know, and they're you know, using tens of thousands of polys and full um, physics simulations and whatnot for hair. And, and cloth and, and that kind of thing uh, is, is, is imp impressive where they're going with that. Do you have a question? Hey, Mike. It's really great to have you out here. We, I mean, I, I'm a really big fan of your games and all your movies. But then what do you think is your favorite part? Is it the movies? Is it the games? Or what is it? Um, you know, I... I I suffer, I, you, people always go, what do you get, bored? Like, is that why you shift from thing to thing? And what I really suffer from is I get interested too easily in things. And so um, right now, I, I'd say the, I just did a big project uh, that will be out soon and involved a big full orchestra at Sky Sound. And that, I really enjoy doing that. I don't, get, I don't do it as often as I would probably Absolutely. like. But when I do do it, I really, really enjoy it. Um, I like film. I, I like all of it, to be totally honest. Um, uh, it, I, I think I like the project that I have going on that I can't talk about. Um, but uh, but I, I wouldn't mind working in film again at some point. Um, so what's the next thing we gamers should look forward to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. If I knew, I would tell you. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Is that it? That's all. Okay. Thank you all.